Well, good evening. Welcome to uh, uh, what I know is going to be one of my favorite concerts with Rafaela Smits, who is so nice. Thank you, first of all, for doing this interview before you have to play. I so appreciate it. Um, we actually had dinner last night and got into hysterics talking about how the interview would go and that she would just give me one syllable answers. <laughs> it's like, do you play the guitar? Yes. <laughs> okay. No, so, <laughs> so tell me, um, first of all, since I've known you, you've always played an eight string guitar. S why, have you always played an eight string or how, how did you come to play the eight string guitar? Why, why did you choose that? Um, as, a, as a kid of, of 16, I went to Spain to study with José Tomás, and he was really an advocate of eight-string guitar. And um, I was listening in the master classes to all these wonderful students, and every time when there was an eight-string guitar, it was sounding so well. What I didn't realize was that those were his students, and they were just outstanding. And so, I was so naive to think it's the guitar. So <laughs> I need that guitar. And Jose Tomas, he went to buy a guitar for me in Madrid. And that was my first eight string. Wow. Yeah. And since, have you ever played a six string guitar? I mean, or Yes, is it, I do. I you, play eight, seven, six string. Okay. Because I, when I look at an eight string guitar or a seven string, I start to weep. I just, I can't figure it out for the life of me, so, I, you know, this is just, so tell us tonight, though, because I know you brought a very special guitar, and I think it is great to, to, to you have many, you, you really love old guitars, I know that, so can you tell us a little bit about what the, the instrument you picked to bring tonight, to play? Well, the guitar I brought is a Miracur, it's an original guitar, in the program it's written, it's a Stauffer, but I brought my Miracur guitar, um, as I was hoping that I could keep it with me on the plane, and it was correct. So uh, it's a wonderful guitar from 1830, uh, eight strings. And uh, so it's from the time of Fernando Sor and a French guitar. Miracour was like a, a little town not so far from Paris. And it was like a, col a, a town with anything else than uh, constructors of violins, luthiers and uh, guitars. Wow, really? Yeah. Great. So the typical romantic guitars were made there in that town, and that's what, why we call it a typical Miracur guitar. I get it. So how do you find a guitar for me? I don't seem to find those. I, I do know Jerry Willard is a friend of mine, and you all know him, he came here, that he, he, he's the kind of guy that someone calls him up and says, there's a guitar in my attic, and it turns out to be a Lacotte, you know, or something like that. But how does one find it, a guitar of this, you know, of, from the 1800s? Like, do, you, do you work through a luthier? Or do, I know you have a great ex friend in Bernard Cress, but... Yes, yeah, yeah, also. But, well, I have a very great friend, a piano player, Van Immersel, and he said, it's like the instruments will find you. Yeah. And I think it's true. I'm so lucky. It's, they always come on my way. I have such a beautiful collection. That's great. So like this guitar, it was really on my way. I was giving a master class in, in Germany and Bernard Kresse, the luthier you just mentioned, he came to the hotel with that guitar and he said, well, you were the third on my list uh, waiting for, for this kind of instrument. Um, but the two others, Pavel Steidl and Brigitte Zazik, they, they didn't want it. And I said, okay, so I looked to it and it was a very good prize. I mean, it was very beautiful, a great prize. It was not sounding yet so fantastic. Why? Because that instrument was kind of forgotten in the original case, somewhere in a castle, in right. the cave, you know, right. just like, like these fantastic stories you never believe it's going to happen. And so, um, Kresse, he went to London to buy it in, at Sotheby's, and he bought it like um, a guitar, a rotten guitar, just in pieces. Oh yeah? my God. And he paid almost nothing. And what was really happening, so the guitar had been in a lot of humidity, and the, the coal, which, is, uh, f it, which was from um, bones, right. yeah? so it's a, it's a kind of a sticky material that when it's very humid, it loses. 
So the guitar was completely intact. It was only in 16 pieces because it was because of humidity, it right, was right. falling apart. So he had to, to re reassemble it, and then it was okay. And so why it was not sounding fantastic on the first months, let's say, it was because it was kind of a new guitar right. from 1830. Wow. And uh, when Pavel visited me, he said, oh, Jesus, why didn't I buy it? I said, too late, too late. You know, you have to risk sometimes right, and, right. and just think, well, who knows? It's going to become beautiful. Great. And it became like one of the, of the most beautiful 19th century guitars. Well, I'm so yeah. looking forward you know, to hearing it. Great. Now, you're playing tonight, obviously, a lot of Bach. Mm -hmm. So I have a few Bach questions. Okay. Now begins the Bach questions. First of all, for those in the audience who are young players um, or want to play Bach, do you, do you kind of, as a teacher, because I know you're a fantastic teacher, and, uh, you. do you, what music do you advise people who, given the, the difficulty of Bach, what music do you sort of advise a student to kind of learn prior to learning a Bach suite, say like a Weiss, or, or what, what, do you ever do that, or do you just say, go ahead, uh, g start off with the, the master? No. Well, Weiss was a master too, but. Yes, yes as well, right, but right. so different, very yeah. different. Um, no, most of the time I don't recommend to play Bach. Because, you don't? No, but they all want to play Bach, so I, I, every one of my students is playing Bach. And definitely now it's like it's in the air. Everyone wants to play back. And right. the more difficult, the better. Right. You know? <laughs> um, no, I, I think it's interesting to, to go as well to the, to the Renaissance and uh, to, to get an understanding of what is an ornamentation, even to the early Renaissance, to the violist. And so, so that they, they learn what is really important in the score and how can you diminish um, the important things with a lot of ornamentation, with the beauty of ornamentation. And then, as you said, of course, um, Weiss is so much easier to play on the guitar. It's uh, probably a little bit more romantic. It's more free. It's more human. Um, that's what they said for many years. I do not agree with that. Right, right. Um, I, but yes, Bach, of course, uh, everyone who has the ability to play it um, shouldn't miss it because it's one of these composers, for me at least, and for many of my students, it starts to be like this. You never get tired of it. Right. Why so do you suppose that is? Because it, it's uh, such, in, there is such a balance in between um, the intellect, the way of writing, the construction, um, the feelings. I think it's very deep music, this uh, Bach music. Well, you're playing one of the all-time deep pieces of all you know, history, the Chacon, and, and I know that you've recorded it. Um, and so how long have you played the Chacon in your life, I and mean, when did you first learn it? I first learned it on my first Bach recording. That was really my very first. I never played it as, as a young player. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, so that must be like 15 years ago, something like that. And and do you find that it's that your interpretation has changed? Like for instance, from from your first recording. I mean, how 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 have you seen a, a change in the way you interpret it? Oh uh, yeah, it changed because I changed. Right. Yeah. So I feel so much more free in what I'm doing now than when I was 25 or 30 or 40. So... Um, can you say, like, when you say you're more free, can you, can you explain to the audience in what way do you mean free? You mean rhythmically? Do you mean no, phrasing, um, ornamentation? Let's say I play, I, like I think it should, it should be played. Okay, and not as somebody else. Yes. Right. And it's a big difference, and this is a big step, I think. We all get through this on a certain moment. Some do it earlier, some later, some never. Right. Um, so it's not played like, uh, if I will play it tonight, I'm not going to think, is he or she going to like this? Right. That's a great point. Yeah. Because I, I just want to play it like I think it should be played to, to the best for back. Right. Mm -hmm. And for you. And for me, yes. Right. Um, are there interpretations of the Chaconne that you love 
you know, that, that you referred to ever or, or not? Have you, you know, you know, throughout your playing of it, is there maybe the Busoni or, uh, or a Baroque violinist or, or any violinist or guitarist or, you know, has there been? Well, there's one version by Gustav Leonhardt on the harpsichord, oh. which I find fabulous. I mean, it's, uh, it's the best, uh -huh. I would say. And when did you encounter that? Did you? Oh, I was a student when I heard that for the first time. So it's always been a sort of a... Yes, that's like my half got, you know. Wow, yeah. great. Yeah. Well, I have, to, I, don't, I, I have other recordings of his, but I, is anybody here have heard that Gustav Fleinhardt's recording of the Chacon? Because I, I, I have his, you know, his first lute suite, you know, and others, but not that. I, I look forward to that. And, and the sound of the harpsichord being so close to the guitar probably, infl you know, had, was inspirational to you as well. It's a, you know, when you were first starting to play it, probably. Um, do you, do you, now I know that you sang in a chorus, right? When you were uh, at a student or before music school, can you talk a little bit about how singing has influenced your playing at all, or the fact that you sang in a chorus? Because I know that you really love to sing. Oh, it definitely uh, influences on every level. I remember I was a, a kid, um, eight, nine years old. I was singing in the choir of the opera for quite some years. And that was my first stage really? uh, experience. And just to be next to one of these big stars, you know, I was just like a stupid little girl, but to be in these beautiful dresses and then next to these big star singers and to be able to share the, the, well, the opera, you know, and the smell of the opera and, and the, the, the rush of the people and, and the energy going through um, was definitely very important. But, of course, the using of the voice as well, the, to be able to, to, to speak words when you are uh, singing um, was helping. The breathing, of right, course, right. Uh, for the phrasing. Um, yeah, and later I, I never developed my voice as a, as a solo singer, but as I did sing so many years, um, I was known as a good singer, uh, freelance in some chamber music choirs. So when I was an adult, I, I was singing as well in the Baroque operas. Wow. And that was another experience. And, and where was that? What, what? That was in Antwerpen, yeah, and in Amsterdam. It was just like the Orfeo production by Monteverdi. And that was, yeah, that was a lifetime experience on every level. And, and so do you sing now? I mean, do you... Do you when I, I mean, teach, I, I yeah, sing. Yeah, I know that you... T yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's, and, and so when did you actually start singing? I mean, what, what age? You, these things, these experience were the well, teenager. Well, in the primary school, yes, in the yeah. primary school, right? Yeah. And um, do you, and you encourage your students to sing, always? I oblige them. Yeah. Yes, they don't like it always. Then I say, well, then you try when you are home. But I think it's so important because you deliver yourself, um, and you understand so much better what's going on in in the phrases. Um, also, physically, it's it's an experience to do. Do you ever do? In, in practicing, do you ever sing and play? You know, like, like as you're playing the second, the second, any of, any of it, do you ever sing as you're playing? Well, I, I did, like, uh, in the Chacon, there is a version um, on the, there is a, a big work by uh, Elga Töner. I don't know if you know that. It's a research, uh -huh. some hundreds of, of pages. And she did the research. Yes, I know, yeah. The but symbolic the audience, background. Yeah. It's the Mormer. Yes, yeah. about um, how this chacon is constructed with all kinds of symbols. Yeah. Uh, and so she went with this, um, with this symbols looking into the, the text of um, the passion. Passions. Passions? Passion, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I was listening to, to a recording um, with the Helion. Yeah. Yeah, ensemble. Oh, so, yeah, so beautiful. beautiful yeah. You die. I mean, yeah. it's fantastic. Does anybody know that recording? It's, it's uh, the Mormer recording. You know it. It's, if you don't have it, it's, it's absolutely stunning. It's on non such uh, records. And it was actually on the bill, charted on Billboard charts about 10 to 15 years ago, I yes. think. 
I can't remember, it sort of feels like it was 10 years ago or yes, something like that. at least, yeah. Yeah. And so after hearing that, it's not that I played it forever and ever, but I, I played it a couple of times. And once you have this hurt, then you cannot uh, forget the words. I know, yeah. So in, in the Chacon, when it's pari, tari, tarim, then in the, in the words it says, uh, they're taught, huh? so the, the, the that, the that, the that. And so whenever you play it then, then you feel this uh, feeling of, of, uh, um, of deep sadness, of deep sadness. Um, and that's not for nothing, because Bach, he wrote it uh, just on the moment when his wife was um, uh, dying. Right, huh? right. Uh, so, I think it's, uh, it's very symbolic and, and it's probably, he wa I don't believe that he was thinking yeah. this, but it's, uh, it's like an icon who yeah. is uh, working together in, in the writing because these, these genius composers, they do not just write notes on a paper. That would be impossible to write so much. They, they, they just are a walking inspiration from, from from more than just earth, I think. Great. Um, and, and speaking of that, the other composers that you picked tonight, Fernando Sor and Meritz, let, let's start with, with Fernando Sor since we're starting the concert with it. That I know is one of your favorite pieces. Is, can you say a little bit about why that piece is so special for you? Well, it's, well, it's one of the last pieces of Sor, and it's, for, for me, it's the closest in, in the way of writing to, to Beethoven. And um, I played it recently to some, there were quite some piano players in the audience, and they, they love that piece as well. Really? I just think it's, it's uh, in all its simplicity, it's so beautiful. It's so incredible beautiful. Um, of course, like many, uh, we love sad pieces, huh? Yeah, <laughs> that's right, the second movement is... <laughs> yes, we have to play fast pieces as well, but um, it's so beautiful that you can make this, this, uh, this again, this singing lines. Huh? Yeah. yeah. It's also, it's, it's a very programmatic piece. Yeah. So it's, you get all the images. It's a, a piece, of long introduction, very typical romantic introduction, and then it's this homage to, to his student who um, gave birth to her first child and, and she, uh, she couldn't survive it. And Fernando Sor was very much taken by this and, and he gave somehow this, um, this recuerdo to, to this woman, to Charlotte. And so uh, you, you really can feel the whole, um, his feelings, I think. Right, yeah. yeah, it's exp yeah. And do you feel that I mean, the, the importance of playing that on a 19th century instrument for you, is that a very, do you, do you feel that it's a very different experience for you to... Completely. To, yeah. Can yes. you say why? Um, uh, yeah. I know that you can, but will you? Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, to start with, the transparency on an on a old guitar is, is uh, so clear. Yeah. Um, then whatever we are looking in a modern instrument, we were not looking, it was the contrary in the, in the old instruments. So the, the one sound of a one string, it's much more like by the, with the violin. In yeah. the violin you have this dark G sound and then you have this almost sharp high sound. And there is no violin player who would say, I'm looking for a violin with a dark, uh, chanterelle with a dark first string, you right. know, and uh, something similar in the in the romantic guitars is happening. So you have this this uh, yeah these very different pitches of of uh, the mid voice, the low voice, and the high voice, and that makes uh, whenever you have a simple modulations modulation, it gives much more the the color of the of the tonality. Mm. I think that's what in certainly in that piece is more most obvious. Right. Yeah. And for the merits, how how does it affect the merits, the playing of the merits this guitar? Well the merits um, is beautiful on this guitar although it was written for a Stauffer guitar, but I, I stopped with uh, traveling with two guitars. Right. So, uh, and it sounds beautiful on this guitar. There is a, a, 
well, everyone is going from time to time on internet. There's a beautiful work, it's uh, translated into English lately, and it's called uh, The Letters of Makarov. And uh, for everyone who is interested in really in how, what is the sound in this 19th century, or how do we live with the sound, um, in that time, Makarov was, a, was an outstanding player and composer, and he, on a certain moment, he was looking for a good instrument. And so you, you can see in his letters which instruments he was finding, oh, wow. and what was his experience about the instrument. And uh, my luck was that I have all the instruments that he's speaking about. <laughs> so I, I could just uh, fit uh, with his, uh, and so the last guitar he bought was a Stauffer. The last one I bought was a Stauffer. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> now, does the merits, because he did play a seven string guitar as well, right? Eight string, eight ten string, string yes. Yeah. And is this piece written for the eight yes. string? Okay, so that's. So good. this is one of the, of the last, well, the, both of them are later um, pieces. And then he was uh, only writing for multiple, multiple strings. Right, right. Yeah. He got a fantastic prize with it, the Makarov Prize, right. the first guitar and composition and guitar building co uh, competition in Brussels, worldwide, wow. yes. And so from all over the world, from Russia, from England, from, uh, of course, from, from Germany, from Austria, from, from Belgium, of course, uh, there was a, this huge festival and uh, Mertz got the first prize. Wow. Uh, but he died before he could get it. <laughs> and so the second prize was uh, for uh, Coste. Uh -huh. And so uh, Coste was absolutely honored that he, um, that he came after Mertz. Yeah. Right. It's so, I'm just, now I'm going to check because cause we could just talk all night. Oh, great, we still have five minutes. Um, I'm going to. I want to continue just a little bit with Meritz. I mean, it's so great for us to hear, because Meritz has played so often on the sixth string. So to actually hear it on the eighth string will be so great uh, um, to hear the original, as, as it were, you know. But why do you suppose, like, Meritz and Costa, you know, all explored, I mean, the guitar, more than anything, explored several strings. You know, they never, we never, we settled on the sixth string, and yet there you are saying, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it. You know? <laughs> well, yeah, that's interesting because that, uh, this issue you find out as well in the letters of Makarov, uh, those are written around the middle uh, of the 19th century. And so it was clear that the amateurs, I'm sorry, Ben. Yeah, well, I am. I they they were playing the sixth string. Yeah. And so whoever... It's, no, it's inferior, let's face <laughs> it. <laughs> and so uh, the, the more outstanding were they, they wanted somehow to, to be able to compete with the pianoforte. Yeah, and course. so the six string romantic guitar, uh, is, it was kind of small. It has a smaller tone than the eight string. Yeah, it's true. In, in the reviews of Giuliani, you know, they even yes. speak yes. of that. Yeah. Yes. Which is earlier, I realize, but still, yes. yeah. And so, yeah, but it, it's, it was just after that. So. Um, yeah, it was almost like a statement. If you played more than six strings, right. you were better. You're better. More yeah. strings, better. <laughs> so I'm going to maybe just put more strings on my guitar, but I don't really have to play them. But now... But they'll be there, yeah. and you people will know, whoa, he, yeah. But I have to say, this was uh, from, from the point of view of the composer. Right. Because for a composer, it's, it's en enriching to be able to, to write for the deep basses, right. you know, you, you just can use it um, like, almost like a, like a piano yeah. instrument. Yeah. yeah, it's so, now, to just in closing, you, you have, uh, I'm just curious, you know, the guitar is so male dominated, there's so many guys that play it throughout history, as a young woman playing the guitar, was there some female guitarist that you just loved or looked up to or, um, well, she was not young anymore. The, I think my, my hero, if I can call it like that, was Maria Luisa Anido. I and, love and her. And where was she? From? I, mean, I know her, but where? Uh, she was from Buenos Aires, and she left her country. She left South America, uh, well, for many reasons. And the main reason was, of course, political. And she lived most of her life in Spain. And that's where I, I met her. She was on a concert. 
Wow. But then she was already old and, and oh, she was so beautiful. I mean, what a soul, what a warmth that she had. And, and still she was able to play. And so I got her old recordings. It, it's unbelievable. It's, I, does, that, does anybody know the name, Anido? Yeah, some. And the recordings, we can still hear them, right? Are there any YouTube things of her, you know, because you can see? Yes, yeah, I, I saw them uh, little by little. They are coming on YouTube, but not when she was young. So when did you discover her? I, I was playing, I, I think I was playing I, um, late 80s uh -huh. in, in Spain. And she was in the audience and, and then we became really good friends. Oh, that's great. Yeah, but really good friends. So we toured around in, in South America together. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It great. was lovely, yeah, and she, she had so much humor, and uh, it was great because I had to play, and she was the diva. Uh -huh. So she didn't play, she just had to enter, and then she got a standing ovation. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I remember one of these beautiful, that's so typical her, of these beautiful phrases, there was someone saying, uh, Senora Maestra uh, Maria Luisa Nido, uh, how can we thank you for what you did for, for our instrument, for the music, for the guitar? And she said, you don't have to thank me, you have to thank my father. Oh, wow. And this was really pointed because she was not allowed to play the guitar. As a woman or as a girl, she was not allowed to play the guitar. She, she played the piano very well. She started to play the cello that was already not very decent, but the guitar that was out of the question. Wow. And uh, she did it in secret. She found the guitar at her house and she was playing under the piano just <laughs> without anyone knowing it. And so when our father found out, he said, you can play the guitar, it's no problem. And the first one she, she played for was for Andres Segovia, who was a little bit older. And so she had an appointment, it's just a nice story. She had an appointment in a hotel room with him. And she was about 14, 15, right. already playing outstanding. I mean, she was such a virtuoso. And so she comes in the room, and the big master is there, you know. And he puts his feet on the table. And he said, okay, what are you going to play? And she looks to him and she said, if you think you can listen to me like that, I'm leaving. And she took her guitar, <laughs> packed it, and she left him. Go, girl! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so that was Maria Luisa Nido in the macho world. But they be became friends later. So when she was an adult, then every time when he was traveling to South America or when she was in, in Spain, then they met and, and uh, there was nothing um, against. I think he appreciated it, that she was so tough. Could anybody cut their feet up here? <laughs> just were not. Anyway, well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Great. Great.